Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're looking at something really quite stark. The Pacific Islands as, well, a kind of front line for the climate crisis. That's a good way to put it. The sources we looked at frame them as this sort of window into our collective future, maybe a quite brutal window. Yeah, brutal seems about right. So let's start with the basics. What's the core mechanism driving this crisis, according to the material? It's uh, depressingly straightforward, really. You start with burning fossil fuels. Okay. That leads to greenhouse gases. Then air temperatures go up. Global warming. Exactly, which heats the oceans. And for these low-lying islands, the direct consequence is rising sea levels. It's a clear chain reaction. And when we say Pacific Islands, we're talking about quite a wide area, aren't we? We are. I think Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, Nauru, Micronesia, Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, and crucially for some of the points we'll discuss, the Marshall Islands. So our mission today is to get a handle on the sheer range of issues here, from like basic habitability and people having to leave their homes. Right. Displacement, infrastructure failing, even entire ecosystems just collapsing. It all stems from that sea level rise and the broader climate change picture. Okay, let's dive into that. One thing that jumps out immediately is this, well, this paradox, this injustice. Mm -hmm. These islands, they aren't typically huge industrial powerhouses, are they? They're not pumping out massive amounts of greenhouse gases. No, not at all. That's the core tragedy highlighted in the sources. Yeah. They're generally not wealthy, not heavily developed in that fossil fuel sense. Yeah. No giant coal mines or gas fields. So they didn't really cause the problem. They contributed almost negligibly. Yeah. Yet they're bearing the absolute brunt of the emissions coming from the industrialized world. It's a huge disproportionate burden. Their future is essentially in the hands of decisions made elsewhere. Completely. They're at the mercy of larger nations' actions, or perhaps more accurately, inactions. And this leads to some incredibly complicated questions, doesn't it? Beyond the immediate human cost. It really does. Think about this. What happens legally, geopolitically, if an entire nation, say the Republic of the Marshall Islands, literally goes underwater? Does it cease to be a country? That's the question. Does it keep its statehood? Does it keep its seat at the UN? Can a nation exist without physical territory? And what about its resources? I know the ocean territory is vital. Exactly. The exclusive economic zone, the EEZ, that's potentially hundreds of thousands of square miles of ocean with rights to fishing, minerals, maybe oil. So if the land vanishes, does the EEZ vanish too? That's the fear. Losing the EED could mean losing their only remaining major asset, right when they need resources the most. It essentially forces climate migration. People become climate refugees needing somewhere to go. Correct. Seeking asylum or residency, dependent on the goodwill of other nations. And there's an economic angle even before the islands are submerged, isn't there? Something about investment. Oh, absolutely. Imagine you're a potential investor. Are you going to pour money into a country that experts are saying has a, quote, time-limited future of actual existence? Probably not. The risk is just too high. Right. So foreign investment dries up. Insurance becomes impossible or prohibitively expensive. The economy starts to crumble long before the final inundation. It's a slow motion collapse triggered by that future threat. Okay, let's shift to the physics of it. You mentioned these islands are incredibly low lying, sometimes just a meter or two above sea level. That's often the case, yes. <laughs> and the danger isn't just that the average sea level creeps up slowly, it's how the warming oceans behave. What do you mean, more storms? Not just storms, but the everyday wave action. Warmer water carries more energy. So the sources, using modeling like the Midway Islands Hindcast data, Hindcast. So looking back at past data to build the model. Exactly. They show increases in wave height, the length of the waves, their strength, how far they push inland. So bigger, more powerful waves hitting the shore more often. Precisely. It leads to something called overwash or overash. Yeah. Basically, seawater washing further and further across the land more frequently, staying longer. And that overwash... It's not just inconvenient, is it? It sounds destructive. It is. It makes living there incredibly difficult, potentially impossible, well before the island is permanently underwater. It poisons the land, damages buildings. And we're seeing people forced to move already because of this. We are. The Midway Islands example is stark. Even with its U.S. ties, about 30% of the people have had to relocate to the mainland U.S. Wow. And you mentioned poisoning the land. Does this overwash affect drinking water? That seems critical. It's perhaps the most critical immediate threat, especially for atolls. Take the Marshall Islands again. Okay. Most atolls rely on what's called a freshwater lens. 
Think of it like a bubble or layer of fresh groundwater that floats on top of the denser salt water below it. Right, rainwater soaking down. Yes, but it's often very thin, very fragile. When the sea level rises or when you get that salt water overwash. It pushes salt water into the lens. Exactly. It contaminates their primary source of natural fresh water. And how do they get water otherwise? Rain. In Majuro, the capital, a huge amount of their supply comes from rainwater captured off the airport runway, a massive catchment system. That sounds precarious. It is. And they also pump from a specific underground source called the Laura Lens. But the more they pump, especially if rainfall is low, the more likely they are to draw in salt water from the edges or below. Correct. Overpumping increases the salinity. It's a terrible bind. And is demand increasing? Yes, significantly. This is another cruel twist. People from the outer atolls in the Marshalls, which have already become uninhabitable due to this overwash. They're moving to the capital. They are. Majuro's population has reportedly increased by around 15% recently because of this internal climate migration. So more people relying on a water system that's already under stress from saltwater intrusion and potentially less reliable rainfall. Precisely. It compounds the pressure enormously. Water scarcity becomes an existential threat very quickly. It really paints a picture of cascading failures. The water contamination isn't just about drinking, is it? It must affect the whole environment. Absolutely. If the fresh water fails, the vegetation reliant on it fails. The whole terrestrial ecosystem is incredibly fragile. And the sources also highlighted impacts on wildlife, specifically birds. Yes, quite dramatically. Mm. The Pacific Islands are vital nesting grounds. We're talking over 18 million seabirds nesting on just 58 islands. 18 million, that's a staggering number. It is. Many are in protected areas, like the U.S. Marine National Monuments established over the last couple of decades, but protection status doesn't stop the sea level rising. And these nesting sites are mostly on low-lying areas. Overwhelmingly. That's where the birds like albatrosses and petrels tend to nest, yeah. right on the coast, often just barely above the high tide line. So they're directly in the path of this overwash and sea level rise. Directly. And we have pretty precise modeling on this now thanks to work by groups like the U.S. funded Pacific Islands Ecosystems Research Center. What kind of modeling? Very sophisticated stuff. High resolution elevation mapping of the islands, yep. advanced wave models like Delf 3D geographic information systems. And what did this detailed modeling predict for the seabirds? They looked at specific scenarios. For example, a two meter sea level rise, which is within the range of projections for the coming century. Okay. Focusing on Midway and the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, the model showed that about 60% of the nesting areas for albatrosses would be overwritten by waves. 60%. And 44% for bone and petrels. That translates to how many actual birds displaced? The number they calculated was around 616,400 breeding birds, just from those two species in that region under that one scenario. Over half a million birds losing their nesting grounds. That's That sounds oh. like an ecological catastrophe. It is. The conclusion is stark. Yeah. Habitat loss from both the slow rise and the increased storm surge and overwash will severely drastically reduce the ability of these islands to support these huge seabird colonies. It's a major blow to Pacific biodiversity. And this destruction connects back to the island's own defenses, doesn't it? The coral reefs. Yes, absolutely. Coral reefs aren't just pretty ecosystems that support fishing and tourism. They are critical natural breakwaters. They absorb wave energy, protecting mm -hmm. the coastline. Exactly. They are the island's first line of defense against the very wave action we've been discussing. But the reefs themselves are threatened by climate change. Terribly so. Increased water temperatures cause coral bleaching and death. Ocean acidification hinders their growth. And stronger wave action, ironically caused by the warming water. Physically breaks up the reefs. Yes. It erodes them, damages them. Yeah. So the natural defense system is weakening precisely when the, threat, the wave energy is increasing. This is a vicious cycle. Weakened reefs mean more overwash, more erosion, more freshwater contamination. The whole system degrades faster. Now, speaking of defense, there's also strategic infrastructure at risk here, isn't there? Particularly in the Marshall Islands. There is. The atoll of Roy Namur hosts parts of the Ronald Reagan ballistic missile test site. It's got key U.S. missile defense monitoring equipment for the Pacific. So major U.S. military assets on a low-lying atoll. Correct. And the vulnerability is frankly alarming, the modeling we discussed earlier, uh -huh. it predicts significant saltwater contamination of that island's crucial freshwater aquifers, 
needed for the bays and personnel, which is 40 centimeters of sea level rise. 40 centimeters. That's not meters. That's yeah. a well within projections for the relatively near future, isn't it? It is. It highlights that this isn't some far off problem. It's an imminent threat, even to high value strategic assets. The cost of climate inaction is starting to hit a very tangible security interests. So pulling all this together, the overwash, the water contamination, the ecosystem damage, the infrastructure threats, what's the overall prognosis from the sources? What's the timeline? The consensus from the science presented is pretty grim. Sea level is rising faster in the tropics than the global average. Okay. The increase in this seasonal saltwater inundation, the overwash, is already rendering parts of many atolls effectively uninhabitable now. Not in 2100, but today. Today. And looking forward, the models suggest most of these atoll islands will reach a point of no recovery, meaning routine widespread inundation that prevents normal life somewhere between 2080 and 2100. Maybe sooner for some. A point of no return, effectively? Effectively, yes. Permanent uninhabitability for many communities. This deep dive really underscores how the Pacific Islands are experiencing the future consequences of climate change right now. It's not abstract for them. Not at all. It's their daily reality and their rapidly disappearing future. Yeah. It's a crisis of survival, of sovereignty, of basic human rights playing out before our eyes. It truly is a window, as we said at the start, a painful look at what inaction means globally. Which leads us to the final, really challenging thought these sources raise, something for you, the listener, to consider. Okay. Given that the science clearly links the destruction, the loss of land, sovereignty, culture, directly to the greenhouse gas emissions, primarily from developed nations' historical and ongoing use of fossil fuels. Right. Do the people of these disappearing nations have any actual, enforceable, legal right to compensation from the countries that caused this crisis? Is there a pathway for climate justice through international law? That question of responsibility, of who pays for the loss and damage, it feels like one of the biggest, most difficult questions we face this century. A huge challenge. Thank you for joining us as we explored this critical story today.